The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. This is one of the books that I plan on rereading actually a number of times this year. And the reason why, it's, it's because it's a very, very deep book. And with any book that is really deep and really powerful, the more you read it, the more you internalize it, the more you realize you don't understand it. And the more you implement it, the more the book actually changes or your awareness goes onto certain parts of it that you didn't grasp before because you weren't ready for it yet. And that information stands out. And then you go and implement that. And you implement it with more presence and awareness. And you come back and you reread the book again. And then you get more insights. The more this happens, when you have a powerful book, this is the kind of nature of what goes on. This is one of those books. So if you're going to read this book, read it, reread it, reread it based on the actions that you take and you apply because then how you see reality will change to one that is more powerful, one that's more empowering, one that's more peaceful. And then from there, there's going to be more deeper nuances that you will get from this book that when you apply will further you down that journey. So what I've done is we've got a number of chapters here. I've pulled three quotes per chapter. It's very deep, so we're going to reflect upon these three quotes, ones that I felt stood out the most that I feel will be the most beneficial to you and that are the most impactful for me at my current stage because everybody sees reality different. Maybe when you read the book, some of the other quotes would stand out even more so. That's what I was talking about earlier. That's why different stages of life different information stands out and becomes more apparent to you. Let's start off with, you are not your mind. Your mind is an instrument, a tool. It is there because to be used for a specific task. And when the task is completed, you lay it down. As it is, I would say about 80 to 90% of most people's thinking is not only repetitive and useless, but because of its dysfunctional and often negative nature, much of it is also harmful. Observe your mind and you will find this to be true. It causes serious leakage of vital energy. Okay, so this is probably one of the big breakthroughs of the book. A lot of us have formed identities with our mind. That part of us that is always thinking. Thinking about concepts, ideas, the future, the past. Always thinking. It's important to think and to think constructively, and to think positively. But there could be a huge problems when you identify yourself with that thinking. The mind is a tool. You are not your mind. You can use this tool to create. You can use this tool to further your purpose, which is to create. But when you identify with it, when you form an identity with it, you miss out on what it's designed to do, not only that, but you prevent yourself from seeing reality for what it really is. And because the mind uses up vital energy, when it essentially is going on and going on and it doesn't stop, it's draining you of valuable resources, valuable resources that you can conserve and redeploy to different areas of your life so you could work longer so you could be more present and value and enjoy the days and really engage yourself in what you're doing, which a lot of times does not involve the mind. Identification with your mind causes thought to become compulsive. Compulsive thoughts. There seems to be kind of a, a badge of honor that's given to somebody that thinks a lot. And the reality is that we don't want to think more. We want to think effectively. We want to use the mind as a tool to think about the right things at the right time to help us create. Everything else should be in being, in doing, in acting, in reflecting, in being in the moment and enjoying the moment. Because it is only from that place where you can get the most valuable, insightful information to feed back to your mind, 
to work with that tool to help you optimize, to help you figure out what to do next. And it's done so in a way that is a lot different than how most people in society transact or carry themselves. If you look around, most people in modern society are always trying to get to some destination or they always have resentment with their past or they're over-identified with their past. They feel that they can't do what they really want to do because of something that happened in their past. And their mind has created all these stories that tells them why the future is better than the now when all that ever existed was the now or the past has held them back. And they're constantly identifying with these stories and the thoughts that spawn from these identification become compulsive. You see, to the ego, the present moment hardly exists. Only past and future are considered important to the ego. Now, I've talked about ego a number of times in a number of videos, and I'm going to talk about it a lot more in my upcoming book discussions. Because I like the, um, there's many different models of looking at the ego, but what I like is the Kabbalah's model, or at least I'm, I'm studying the Kabbalah a little bit, and I have come across a book, and I might do a discussion on that book, but essentially the ego is a part of you that you were born with that was given to you to essentially, you could say, battle with, to spar with, to help you realize just how powerful and great you are and to really value the gifts that were given to you, the God-given gifts. And the, the ego helps you value these gifts as you overcome it, as you learn to manage it. But however, it will always be there. And the more success that you have, the more this ego will creep up and the more the ego will try to outwit you. Another book that I'm going to do is Outwitting the Devil by Napoleon Hill. So essentially, the ego does it through various mechanisms. And if you understand these mechanisms, then you could play the game better with the ego. Now, why do you want to play the game with the ego? Well, you do it so that you can understand who you really are, so you can value what is really important and not identify with the ego because the ego is not you. It's not you. You can feed the ego by attaching to the past or constantly thinking about the future and where you want to be and not valuing what you have right now, not having gratitude. And then you will form an identity with that ego. You'll believe that that ego is you. So being present and being in the now means letting go of that ego. Means actually stepping out of the mind. The mind is a tool. It's not who you are. Consciousness, the way out of pain. The pain that you create now is always some form of non-acceptance, some form of unconscious resistance to what is. On the level of thought, the resistance is some form of judgment. On the emotional level, it is some form of negativity. The intensity of the pain depends on the degree of resistance to the present moment. And this in turn depends on how strongly you are identified with your mind. The mind always seeks to deny the now and to escape from it. In other words, the more you are identified with your mind, the more you suffer. Or you may put it like this. The more you are able to honor and accept the now, the more you are free of pain, of suffering, and free of the egoic mind. Again, non-acceptance, okay, not accepting things for the way they are. I'm not talking about passively and putting up with stuff you shouldn't be putting up with. I'm talking about understanding that what's happening right now is what's happening right now. And I'm not going to connect that in my mind to stories from my past or uh, identifications that are ego-based to create resentment and anger and frustration or anything disempowering, but rather to accept that the way it is right now and recognize that that's not you. The ego has given meaning, uh, meaning to that, and it's causing you certain kinds of grief. Now, you might even look at that and say that the ego actually is amplifying the pain. For most of us, it's like this. When we experience pain, the ego 
amplifies it. It amplifies it to further internalize it to root itself in you. If you accept, you, and again, not passively, what is happening to you and you say, this is what's happened and now I'm going to do something about it. Now I'm going to do something positive about it. Now I'm going to steer it in my direction. Then you're less likely to identify with that pain or feel it to that magnitude or identify with that negativity. When you identify with that negativity and that pain excessively, that part will root itself into your subconscious mind. And then later on, when the ego needs to draw upon more power over you and something happens to you in that moment, it will relate it back to that past pain and bring you back there further feeding itself. Again, the ego is something that, if you look at it from the Kabbalistic point of view, that we've put together to help us grow, to appreciate things. So if you can think about this, real appreciation, real gratitude is being in the now, being in the moment, understanding that all that really matters is this moment. And when you value this moment, you create the neural pathways to always value the present. And you bring that with you into different moments. And the more you do that, the more you further solidify those patterns and the more you will value the now and be present to the now later on because that's where you'll find happiness a lot of people think that happiness is going to be sometime in the future when the conditions of the now change the reality is if the conditions of the future change or the conditions change and it becomes like the future you still won't be happy because everywhere you go there you are who you are right now how you do one thing is how you do everything if you no longer want to create pain for yourself and others, if you no longer want to add to the residue of past pain that still lives in you, then don't create any more time or at least no more than necessary to deal with the practical aspects of your life. How do you stop creating time? Realize deeply that the present moment is all you have. All that ever existed is the present moment. All that ever will exist is the present moment. Time is something that we've created as a construct and it's valid. We can quantify time, we can explain time, we can work with time, and we should work with time. And I believe that we shouldn't deny time, at least not in our current state of evolution or in mine. But I look at time differently. I look at it as something that I understand that exists. However, the most important thing is the thing I'm doing right now. The most important person is the person I'm talking to now. In five minutes from now, if I'm talking to someone else, that will be the most important person because all that ever existed is the now. So I have to become really present and aware to the now. Now, why would I want to do this? Because it's from there you show real gratitude. You experience real emotions. Things are more vibrant. Things are uh, The experience is improved. And then as you hit your goals, you will value what you hit. Now, I've been in stages in my life where I've been more on focused on the future, and thus I wasn't present to the moment, present to the now. And then when I got to the destination that I was seeking, I didn't really value it as much. And then when I look back to when I was a kid and really valuing certain moments, they, as simple as those moments seemed, seemed more joyous and more valuable and more, more powerful and enjoyable. And I recognize that's because Everywhere I go, there I was. Or everywhere I go, there I am. So therefore, if I'm not valuing this moment, then when I get to my higher level of goal that I want to achieve, I'm not going to really value it. And I have to constantly and consistently train myself to value the now. Accept and then act. Whatever the present moment contains, accept it as if you had chosen it. Work with it, not against it. Make it your friend and ally, not your enemy. This will mirac miraculously transform your whole life. Okay, Make it your friend, not your enemy. Talk about this with the ego. The ego is like, kind of like your partner, your sparring partner. You, you play games with each other to see who can outwit each other, and that's what gives you the power. If you say that the ego has more power over you, then you're essentially surrendering. Think about that. So the key is to accept what happens right now and then from there act. And you will be better equipped to make a better decision because you're basing it from 
your source energy, your connectedness to God, your purpose, and you're not basing that action based on fear, anger, resentment, or anything else that is an aspect that was constructed through time and past experiences and stories, etc., generated by the mind for the ego. Moving deeply into the now. Have you ever experienced, done, thought, or felt anything outside the now? Do you think you ever will? Is it possible for anything to happen or be outside the now? The answer is obvious, is it not? Nothing ever happened in the past. It happened in the now. Nothing will ever happen in the future. It will happen in the now. So again, time construct, there is a past and there is a future, but anything that ever happens happens in the now. The now, as in 2018, January 1st, will show up when that now happens, or that future of 2018, January, will show up, but that'll still be the now. And as I mentioned, everywhere you go, there you are. Okay, so if you want to get into like some really deeper stuff, I recommend you study uh, Bob Proctor. A lot of spiritual stuff talks about how energy always existed. It cannot be created. It cannot be destroyed. However, it can change based on the projections of our internal reality, how we see things. Thoughts create things. You can study this stuff. I might do some books on it. But essentially, stuff changes because of thought. So thought is driven by, or what creates things, the thought is, be, is driven by energy. The energy and the passion to take action changes the matter around to create things. And because everywhere you go, there you are, if you're not operating from that frame right now, then you're not carrying with you the power that you are capable of carrying through your journey day by day to create what you really want. And it starts with the now. All negativity is caused by an accumulation of psychological time and denial of the present. Unease, anxiety, tension, stress, worry, all forms of fear are caused by too much future and not enough presence. Guilt, regret, resentment, grievances, sadness, bitterness are all forms of non-forgivingness. Non-forgivingness are caused by too much past and not enough presence. You think about that for a moment. If you're holding on to any of these you are uncalibrated. If you start to remove these aspects, you are now in the now. You are centered, you are grounded in the now. One of the best ways that I find to help me with these areas is to observe myself on how I respond to different stimulus as I carry myself throughout the day. Then ask myself, checklist style, Is my response based on any of these things? And if they are, am I looking to past situations or am I looking too much into the future and thus not valuing this moment? And it's a very humbling experience to realize that you have control over this and that the feelings that you have come from your mind which travels into these past and future uh, time spaces, whatever you want to call it, and generates those kinds of emotions. And then when you become present to the now, the mind goes away in the sense that that feeling goes away. It's no longer identified with that feeling because now you're taking possession back of your mind and thus you're not feeding the ego. And now you're back to the baseline or back to really valuing what matters in the moment, in the now. You think that your attention is in the present moment when it's actually been taken up completely by time. You cannot be both unhappy and fully present in the now. So think about that. You cannot be both unhappy and fully present in the now. If you are unhappy, you are not in the now. 
You need to do things to bring yourself into the now. Some of the things that I do is meditation, connecting with people, conversing with people, but not in a way where I want to tell them about myself, but rather listen and understand and see things their way, understand their point of view and really value who they are and work with the energy of the interaction rather than what's being said conceptually in the mind. Other things you could do is sports, running. There's different things. Different things that you could do to be present in the now. And when you are present, you'll find you can't be unhappy. You can connect with Some people are very good at bringing people into the now. Certain people that you hang out with, if they're very present, they will bring you into the now and all of a sudden you're Worries and problems will just disappear and time will just go by. But it wouldn't even matter because you are so present that all you're experiencing is that pure joy and energy and bliss in that moment as a result of that person's present energy being projected onto you, essentially facilitating your own present energy to come out. That's why I recommend you find people like that and you associate with people like that because you train yourself to make that a predominant state. Mind strategies for avoiding the now. Wherever you are, be there totally. If you find you're here and now intolerable and it makes you unhappy, you have three options. Remove yourself from the situation, change it, or accept it totally. If you want to take responsibility for your life, you must choose one of these three options and you must choose now. Then accept the consequences, no excuses, no negativity, no psychic pollution. Keep your inner space clear. Die to the past every moment. You don't need it. Only refer to it when it's absolutely relevant to the present. Feel the power of this moment and the fullness of being. Feel your presence. I'm 36 years old right now, and thus I've had a lot of life experience in contrast to when I was 19 or 20 years old. And throughout those years, I've experienced hardship, trauma, different situations that have come up. And thus, I have to be even more diligent, at least that's what I find, to make sure I'm not forming an identity with those past situations and past traumas, and past hardships. And essentially rewrite those stories and give it an empowering meaning because if not, it will weigh me down as I move in life. As a result of doing it, I feel more energized now than I have ever done or I've never felt in my entire life. I don't feel like things are holding me back as much as they used to, even in my 20s. And a lot of it has to do by not associating with stories and identifications from my past. That doesn't mean I'm in resistance to it and I don't appreciate it, I appreciate it greatly, and I see my past as a teacher and different things that happened to me as a teacher. However, I let go of the emotions that don't move me forward, that hold me down, the excess baggage. And by doing that, I can be more present, but I can also carry into the future, which again is the now, because all that exists in the now, a lot more of a lighter energy. You can see people as they age, they give signs of being worn down and carrying a heaviness with them. You can kind of see it almost physically in their body. It's like this gravitational, you can just feel the energy of them holding on to their past still. And it's sad because they don't realize a lot of times, and if you try to talk to them about it, they won't want to hear it because they form such a deep identity with their past that it is so hard for them to let go of it. They actually have to seek professional help to be able to know, you know, not just watching a couple videos on YouTube or reading a couple books is going to help them. They need an intervention. And for some people, they've gone so far into it that maybe there isn't anyone qualified to help them. Okay, so understand this about yourself as you're listening to this. Recognize that you don't want to end up in a situation where your story of who you are and what you're capable of is so held back by the negativity and situations in your past, which a lot of times, you know, you didn't have control over. You didn't understand how it worked. It was quite traumatic and so forth, but you have to make peace with it. 
in order to move on. One day I'll make it. Is your goal taking up too much of your attention that you reduce the present moment to a means to an end? It is, to, is it taking the joy out of what you're doing? Are you waiting to start living? If you develop such a mind pattern, no matter what you gr- uh, achieve or get, the present will never be good enough. The future will always seem better. A perfect recipe for permanent dissatisfaction and non-fulfillment, don't you agree? So on the flip side, living your past, there's a dark side to being too attached to your future. I know I've fallen in this trap. I've fallen in both traps. I'm sure we all have. And so now my model is essentially to set a goal and be really present in the moment as I work towards that goal, appreciating all the areas of my life and understanding that I could appreciate those areas even more. And by doing this, I'm making better decisions instead of just getting caught up in the process of trying to grind today for tomorrow, 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 always. Because when you get there, and this has happened to me a few times when I've gotten to my goals, I wasn't able to enjoy the fruits of the labor. I didn't find it enjoyable. I got to certain places where I got a certain level of results and I started traveling and it took me a while to enjoy traveling in some of these exotic destinations because I was so looking forward to that day that I didn't value the now. And when that now became that day that I was traveling, I didn't know how to be in the now. Okay, so understand that there's a dark side for being too far in the past and or too attached to the past and being too attached to the future. State of presence. As long as you are in a state of intense presence, you are free of thought. You are still yet highly alert. The instant your conscious attention sinks below a certain level, thought rushes in. The mental noise returns. The stillness is lost. You are back in time. Stephen Kotler calls this, or even the other book, I can't pronounce his name, but it's called Flow. Stephen Kotler's book is Rise of Superman, and the other book's called Flow. Talks about flow state. Yeah, I think this is very related to the now. In a sense, the state of presence could be compared to waiting. Jesus used the analogy of waiting in some of his parables. This is not the usual bored or restless kind of waiting that is in denial of the present and that I spoke about already. It is not waiting in which your attention is focused on some point in the future and the present is perceived as an undesirable obstacle that prevents you from having what you want. There is a qualitatively different kind of waiting, one that requires your total alertness. Something could happen at any moment, and if you are not absolutely awake, absolutely still, you will miss it. This is the kind of of waiting Jesus talks about. Okay, This is a really important, this has made probably the most greatest impact in my life when it comes to business in a lot of areas of my life. There's a saying, if you're ready, the opportunity comes, you don't need to get ready to execute upon it, to go after it, because you're ready. So a lot of this is, in a way, waiting, but it's prepared waiting. It's kind of like active waiting. It's conscious waiting. Because within your awareness right now, there is opportunity. The problem is you don't see it. And you don't see it because... Maybe you're too fixated onto your past and you're forming an identity around it right now. Or maybe you're thinking about something else that you should be doing. Therefore, you're not valuing what's right now. And if you're doing that, and that's your predominant state, how many opportunities are you missing in all the important areas of your life? When I learned to be totally still and present and aware, the opportunities stand out. I kid you not, sometimes I could be out and about in a busy environment and there's a lot of people And a person will stand out. They'll almost glow. And I'll go and talk to them. And that's the person I was supposed to talk to. Those kind of situations happen when I'm fully present or as present as I could be because they stand out. I don't know how it works totally. Maybe it's law of attraction. Maybe it's the reticular activating system. But that is the kind of stuff that they're talking about here. And this exists in business. Okay, Business opportunities, some of the most profitable opportunities that I had came as a result of being in a place of waiting. And again, not passively because it's active waiting. You're still doing things, but you're open. You're in the moment. You're present to the moment is doing. And then all of a sudden you see something and it stands out and it's crystal clear. 
of what that means. It's a sign. And you do it. You go after it. And it produces results. Many people are so imprisoned by, in their minds that the beauty of nature does not really exist for them. They might say, what a pretty flower. But that's just a mechanical mental labeling because they are not still, not present. They don't truly see the flower. They don't feel its essence, its holiness. Just as they don't know themselves, don't feel their own essence, their own holiness. Again, it's one thing to rationalize and conceptualize what beauty is. And I'm one that likes to rationalize and conceptualize things, but I recognize that there's a dark side to that because then you miss out on what it really is, the reality, the now, which is not a form of mind. Okay. One of the things that I like to do, I make these videos, I really enjoy making them. I try to, most of my day is spent being present to the tasks that I'm doing. I'm rarely talking as much as this, unless I'm dealing with certain kinds of clients, or I'm teaching workshops, etc. Very little am I engaging my mind to conceptualize to be able to explain things. I used to do this way more before. But when I realized that it's far better to be present, not have the mind involved so much, but rather have me control the mind and work with it to create, then I'm more likely to appreciate the beauty and I'm more likely to see the opportunity without projecting my bias that either comes from my future or my past or any other types of aspects related to the ego. The inner body. The feeling of your inner body is formless, limitless, and unfathomable. You can always go to it more deeply. So he talks about inner body and the outer body. The outer, bo outer body essentially is, or the physical body, is the physical body. We know what it is. But there's an inner body that is limitless, unfathomable. It's connected to your source. You are not your body. Your body is also your tool, just like how your mind is your tool. Okay, really think about that and really internalize that because once I studied this back in the days, you know, that concept, it really helped me. Because then you don't identify yourself with the insecurities that come from comparing yourself to other people because your body doesn't look a certain way, etc. Your body is not who you are. People, don't, people respect you and appreciate you for who you are only, only if you understand who you are which you realize that your mind and body is an aspect in this physical reality, but it's not really who you are. And when you let that real you shine out, people will see that, but you have to go first. Okay, you have to go first. It's hard. I, I get it. When you're out in society and you're walking around and you're connecting with people and you are doing business, etc., it's very easy for the ego to revert back because of fear and insecurity to identify with the body. It's hard to stay conscious, but it gets easier. And through exercise and being present and aware and really practicing, that's why I recommend reading this book over and over again, you get better at it. Whenever you are waiting, whether it be use that time to feel the inner body. In this way, traffic jams and lineups become very enjoyable. Instead of mentally projecting yourself away from the now, go deeply into the now by going more deeply into the body. The art of inner body awareness to develop into a completely new way of living. Uh, the art of inner body awareness will develop into a completely new way of living, a state of permanent connectedness with being, and will add a depth to your life that you have never known before. If you keep your attention on the body as much as possible, you will be anchored to the now. You won't lose yourself in the external world. You won't lose yourself in your mind. Thoughts and emotions, fears, and desires may still be there to some extent, but they won't take you over. So again, this is having attention on the body in a way that you recognize that you are controlling your body. A lot of times we're so identified with our physical body that we forget that we're actually driving this body. So that's the kind of awareness he's talking about here. So as you're sitting in the car, or if you're sitting right now, wherever you are listening to this, be aware of your body. Feel the you know, the feelings of being in your body it gives very specific exercises in the book. I recommend you do it. But one of the ways that I do it is to, as I'm walking around and uh, just doing stuff, I observe myself moving my body. I observe myself controlling the movement of my body. And I feel what it's like to move my arms around and my legs around, etc. 
And something interesting happens when I do this. I feel like I carry myself a lot better because I'm really operating from a higher place. And some people are so caught up in just being responsive to whatever stimulus is thrown at their body that they, they carry a very reactive frame to them. They're very reactive. If you want to reduce the amount of reactiveness, you have to observe how your body interacts with the environment and understand that you control the body. And then as the stimulus is being fed to the body, you can adjust that accordingly. Portals into the unmanifested. Qi is the inner energy field of your body. It is the bridge between the outer you and the source. It lies halfway between the manifested, the world of form, and the unmanifested. Qi can be likened to a river or an energy stream. If you take the focus of your consciousness deeply into the inner body, you are tracing the course of this river back to its source. Qi is movement. The unmanifested is stillness. When you reach a point of absolute stillness, which is nevertheless vibrant with life, you have gone beyond the inner body and beyond qi to source itself, the unmanifested. Qi is the link between the unmanifested and the physical universe. Now let this be your spiritual practice. As you go about your life, don't give 100% of your attention to the external world and to your mind. Keep some within. I've spoken about this already. Feel the inner body even when engaged in any everyday activities, especially when engaged in relationships or when you are relating with nature. Feel the stillness deep inside. Keep the portal open. It is quite possible to be conscious of the unmanifested throughout your life. You feel it as a deep sense of peace somewhere in the background, a stillness that never leaves you, no matter what happens out there. You become a bridge between the unmanifested and the manifested, the God between God and the world. This is the state of connectedness with the source that we call enlightenment. Enlightened relationships. Relationships is an important topic, and this book shares a lot of insights about relationships, some that I've been pondering upon and I really recognize in my past relationships, and I want to share with you what I got out of it. Unless and until you access the consciousness frequency of presence, all relationships, and particularly intimate relationships, are deeply flawed and ultimately dysfunctional. They may seem perfect for a while, such as when you are in love, but invariably that apparent perfection gets disrupted with arguments, conflicts, uh, dissatisfaction, and emotional pain, or even physical violence as they occur with increasing frequency. So if you're not happy with who you are, if you're not at peace, you don't recognize who you really are and, and see there's more to you than your ego, your mind, your body, etc., then how you operate in a relationship, as the saying goes, everywhere you go, there you are, is going to come from that place. Now, relationships can be especially devastating, romantic relationships especially, devastating, even friendships, if it doesn't come from a pure place. Because a lot of times people get into relationships to fill an inner void, something that's missing in their lives. And in the earlier stages, this other person that they connect with fills these voids. But then later on, stuff starts to surface up, things that they don't like about the other person. And what happens is because this person that they connected with, that they kind of saw as like this certain being, is now uh, appearing different or revealing some aspects to themselves that they didn't see before, they start to blame that person. When in actuality, it's an opportunity because what that person is really revealing is the things that the other person doesn't like and love about themselves that they avoided to overcome before they got into the relationship. Okay? So... Can we change an addictive relationship into a true one? So the relationship, he talks about being addictive because of those chemicals that are released and not beyond that, the voids that are filled and so forth that give us a temporarily uh, a relief. You know, when somebody loves you and looks at you a certain way and you're very blissful and so forth, it can give you a kind of a, it's kind of like taking a drug or uh, drinking some alcohol and give you temporary relief. And if that's no longer there, you might seek it elsewhere. You're constantly seeking it elsewhere, or even worse, um, you 
kind of force the other person to be that way when they don't really want to be that way or that's not really who, who they are because you created a story. So that's what he's talking about when he's talking about addictive relationships. So can we change an addictive relationship into a true one? Yes. Being present and intensifying your presence by taking your attention even more deeply into the now. Whether you are living alone or with a partner, this remains the key. Because again, you're not going to get attached to the stories of the past or over-identified of what you want to see happen in the future. Think about how that relates to in relationships. People have expectations of what they want from the other person in the future. And certain situations that the person, uh, things that the other person does, triggers responses on the, from the other person's past. And then the ego comes in, and then the mind comes in. And because emotions in relationships and relationships with people are so uh, revealing and close to us, we have a very deep bond when we fall in love with someone, um, it creates a powerful, potent mix of, of essentially avoiding the situation. I mean, there's a lot more to this. I'm not going to get too deep into it. But when you look at how when, some, when people fall in love, and I've been in love a number of times. All you see is a certain view of the person. And from that, if you come from a place of insecurity and the person does something that threatens that that love might not be there or it could change or something like that, because that love is so deep, it's going to trigger you back to past situations or something that you envision them to be in your future. And you're going to try to control them in some shape or form. And they're going to feel that and you're going to be met with hostility. And then it's going to turn into arguments and dispute. The best way to be is be in the moment and unconditionally accepting the person for who they are. Now, this can be really hard because, like I said, love is a very powerful emotion. And you expect things to be a certain way when you're in love. And that's called conditional love. That's not unconditional love. And... By being present, working on being present prior to getting in the relationship, and you can do it, build upon it while you're in the relationship. But ideally, you want to, even if you're not in a relationship, keep working on being present because, and being in the now. Because then when you find yourself in a relationship and the emotions really uh, steer you into different directions where you're being stirred up inside, you are able to better understand what's happening. And you're more likely to not project onto them a story from your past or expectations from the future and you're more likely to be compassionate and accepting for who they are and once you start doing that the lines of communication starts to open the greatest the greatest catalyst for change in a relationship is complete acceptance of your partner as he or she is without needing to judge or change them in any way that's a very powerful statement okay a lot of times we want to change people to be someone else because we are not happy with who we are when you accept who you are in every aspect of yourself, you will accept people for who they are. And if you get yourself in a relationship with someone, you're going to accept them for who they are. And your ability to accept them for who they are is going to be dependent on your ability to accept yourself for who you are. Okay, so you will experience change and growth in the relationship if there's no need to judge or change them in any way. You accept them really accept them that immediately takes you beyond ego all mind games and all addictive clinging are then over there are no victims and there are no perpetrators anymore no accuser and accused this is also the end of all codependency of being drawn into somebody else's conscious pattern and thereby enabling it to continue if you both agree that the relationship will be your spiritual practice so much the better you can then express your thoughts and feelings to each other as soon as they occur or as soon as a reaction comes up so that you do not create the time gap in which an unexpressed or unacknowledged emotion or grievance can fester and grow. And probably one of the most pinnacle thoughts of this chapter, in my opinion, is if you cannot be at ease with yourself when you are alone, you will seek a relationship to cover up your unease. You can be sure that the unease will then appear in some other form within the relationship 
and you will probably hold your partner responsible for it. Let's talk about beyond happiness and unhappiness. There is peace. Happiness depends on conditions being perceived as positive. Inner peace does not. Okay, see the difference? Inner peace is unconditional. It is not dependent on certain aspects that if they exist, then you're happy, and if they don't exist, you're not happy. Whether anything nev- when, whenever anything negative happens to you, there's a deep lesson concealed within it. Although you may not see it at the time, even a brief illness or an accident can show you what is real and unreal in your life, what ultimately matters and what doesn't. I'm sure we've all experienced situations like that. Ego is the unobserved mind that runs your life when you are not present as the witnessing consciousness, the watcher. The ego perceives itself as a separate fragment in a hostile universe with no real inner connection to any other being. Surrounded by other egos, which it sees as a potential threat or which it will attempt to use for its own ends. The basic ego patterns are designed to combat its own deep-seated fear and lack of, of sense of lack. They are resilience or they are resistance, control, power, greed, defense, attack. Some of the ego strategies are extremely clever, yet they never truly solve any of its problems simply because the ego itself is the problem. So the key is to be the observer to observe how you respond to things, to recognize when the ego is taking over. And in the earlier stages, you'll find that it's harder to differentiate when the ego is taking over and when it's not. That's because perhaps you have been very identified with the ego. In later stages, you'll be able to proactively and preemptively prevent yourself from being in situations where your ego will take control. And you will be able to respond quickly when you find the earlier stages of your ego's response, bringing you into a situation where it feeds itself and you'll be able to deal accordingly. You can still be able, you can still be active and enjoy manifesting and creating new forms and circumstances, but you won't be identified with them. You do not need them to give you a sense of self. They're not your life, only your life situation. So what this means is, with this understanding, being in the now, you're not going to become this person that is just not going to be driven or motivated to create or passionate about what you do. That's not what it's about. You'll be able to do it from a better place. You will be able to create and do things. However, you won't form identities around the things that you create, the personas that you step into for that moment in time in certain social situations or business situations wherever you won't form identities around that you'll look at it as a life experience something that you'll appreciate and enjoy in the now however you'd be okay to let go of it if you needed to and it would be something that will grow you it will build you up Again, you won't be identified with it, but you'll be able to create it. And you're more likely to create this because it will be unfiltered or won't be distorted by certain kinds of mechanisms that prevent us from creating consciously, like fear. The meaning of surrender. To some people, surrender may have negative connotations, implying defeat, giving up, failing to rise to the challenges of life, becoming lethargic, and so on. True surrender, however, is something entirely different. It does not mean to passively put up with whatever situation you find yourself in and to do nothing about it. Nor does it mean to cease making plans or initiating positive action. Surrender is simply is simple but profound wisdom of yielding to rather than opposing the flow of life. The only place where you can experience the flow of life is in the now. So to surrender is to accept the present moment unconditionally and without reservation. So surrendering. When you have confidence, deep-rooted confidence, you are okay to surrender 
knowing that you will achieve, you will get whatever you want, and you'll get it at the best time, and you're okay with what's happening right now, even if it's not going in a way that you conceptualize in your mind that it should go, you're okay with it. That's what he's talking about. It's a certain kind of power. It's power without force. It's an interesting position to be in, and we've experienced it sometimes. So I want you to think about in different situations in your life where you've experienced that and look at the different dynamics that made it possible. Most likely, you were present to the moment. You were present in the moment. You were enjoying the moment. Everything just seemed to flow gracefully. You knew from that place the right decisions to make, the things to say, how to move forward. That's because you had surrendered. You weren't holding on to identities, past, future, agendas. I talk about having strategy, but strategy is not the same as agenda. Dynamics of the moment can change. You've got to be able to surrender to it and understand that you will achieve what you want to achieve. You will get the end result. And the moment that you feel a desperation energy or an energy where you feel you need to control the situation, well, maybe that's not the thing you really want and you're just kidding yourself and maybe that's the thing the ego wants. Or maybe it is the thing that you do want, really want. However, what's holding you back from getting it is that you haven't released the energy, the negativity, the resentment, the whatever, the tense energy that's essentially acting as a blockage from preventing that thing from coming into your life. If you find yourself in a life situation, if you find your life situation unsatisfactory or even intolerable, it is only by surrendering first that you can break the conscious resistance pattern that perpetrates the situation. The ego is cunning. So you have to be very alert, very present, and totally honest with yourself to see whether you have truly relinquished your identification with a mental position and so freed yourself from the mind. If you suddenly feel light, clear, and deeply at peace, that is an unmistakable sign that you have truly surrendered. Then observe what happens to the other person's mental position as you no longer energize it through resistance. When identification with mental positions is out of the way, true communication begins. I thought this was a great question he asked at the end of the book, the person that was interviewing him. How will I know when I have surrendered? His response was, when you no longer need to ask the question. Very subtle, nuanced. You understand nuances when you get into the now. So I hope you found this video useful, and if you want to get a copy of this mind map, the link is in the bottom of the description. I recommend that you go out and you get this book, and you study it. And like I said earlier, you read it, you reflect upon it, and you apply. And I don't feel like I really gave the magnitude of what this book contains within it in this video. So when you study it, go and apply it, and then reread it again. This is one of those books where you can keep rereading over and over again and you'll get more and more profound meanings. And you will find yourself being more at peace, more accepting of the way things are right now in a way that's beneficial to who you really are. And you'll find yourself valuing not only the now as in this moment more, but wherever you go in life, you will value that moment even more. Thank you very much for watching. I'll talk to you soon. Take care.